If you're trying to get one of these, you came to the right video. This is gonna be 12 things you need to know before running your first 100 mile ultra marathon. This video is gonna greatly increase your chances of completing this goal. Make sure you stick around for the whole video because one of the tips is gonna make sure you don't end up having feet that look like this. So number one, make time for recovery. Especially if this is your first 100 mile ultra, the stress on your body is going to be kind of unlike anything you've ever experienced in your life. Like I said, I'm on day three right now and I'm just kind of starting to feel normal. However, my watch actually still says that I am in the excessive fatigue category and I was actually in the 100, which you can't go any higher than that for the first two days. It didn't, it literally didn't even move. Also schedule mentally draining things for later on in the week. You're going to want to jam a lot of protein, collagen, vitamins, get your sleep, get some small walks. I got some compression socks, they really work, and obviously ice baths, toe spacers, all that kind of stuff. Okay, let's get into some racing tips. So number two, how can you break down the race? So first, you don't want it to seem so big that it seems unimaginable. 100 miles is a ton of miles, and if you think of it as just that, 100 miles, it's going to seem overwhelming. So some people will probably divide it into two 50 mile runs, or four 25 mile runs, or five 20 mile runs something like that, which was something that I thought about prior to the race until I got my hands on the aid station spreadsheet. And basically each aid station was separated by so many miles. And so that's what I ended up using to break down the race. I would only look at that and I wouldn't even think about what mile I was on in the totality of the race. It was very, very effective and something I would do again if I raced. Okay, number three, liquid calories. Now, if you've ever done an ultra marathon, you know that at some point there is a time where you are not able to eat solid foods anymore. The reason is, is because a lot of your blood from your digestive system is now going into your legs and other muscles to try and power your body through this extreme thing. So what I like to do is I like to eat as much solid foods as I can at the start of the race. Now when you get to that point of only being really able to consume liquids, is you're gonna wanna make sure that you have liquids that actually have calories, carbs, and sugars in them so you're getting what you would from solid foods but it's just in liquid form. So what really, really worked well for me was honestly Coca-Cola. I don't know the last time I've had a soda, but it was a lifesaver on this Ultra because if I didn't have it, I don't know where I would have got most of my calories from. Uh, it also has a little bit of caffeine as well, so it really powered me through a lot of miles. What else you can use is ginger chews. So I use some ginger candy, and the reason is is because ginger can settle your stomach and uh, decrease your nauseousness. When I was in my 50 miler and I was having stomach issues, someone mentioned to try ginger ale, at the next aid station, I did, and it completely resolved my symptoms, so I've been a believer ever since, and I had about two or three ginger chews on this 100, and I never had real bad stomach issues like I did on my 50. The other drink that hit the spot for me was orange juice. And speaking of hitting the spot, if you could go ahead and hit that like button, as well as subscribe to this channel, I would really appreciate it, and as a thank you, here's a picture of my sunburnt head. Make sure you're making the most out of running with people. So what I mean by this is before you pick up a pacer, what I like to do is try to meet people on the run and just have conversations with them. It's almost like my personal podcast and it's distracting enough where the miles just will really click by. What I also like doing is trying to find someone that's way more experienced than I am and kind of pick their brains about what their strategy is for the race. Always have buffer time for your cutoffs. Now, people are probably like, well, no shit, Chad. But here's what I mean by this. Our first cutoff was at 49 point some miles and everybody's watch had it actually at over 51 miles. Now that was a difference of two miles, which can make a huge difference if you're very close to the cutoff and you think it's 49, but you actually have two more miles to go. This resulted in me playing catch up for the rest of the race because ultimately by the end of the race I actually had 103.2 miles the race was supposed to be just at 100 so what I would say for this is to research what other people say about the race I had talked to somebody else that had raced it last year and they said the same thing happened and apparently they haven't fixed it so something to consider do some research on the race talk to people if 
they've raced it, see how accurate the aid stations and the cutoffs are. More established races will probably have more accurate mileage and more accurate cutoff time. Okay, next, pacers. Number one, it's probably best to have minimal pacers. The reason this is because of the logistics of getting pacers in and out of a certain area because you're gonna have to leave a car somewhere, grab a car again, pacer runs to the next aid station but then has to get back to their car and, and all this stuff. So the less pacers, the less complicated it will be. Now the other thing I like to do with a pacer was have them run ahead to alert my crew when we were getting into an aid station as to what I would like to have out for me to grab real quickly as I came in through the aid station. Okay, next is TIB training. So people are like, what the heck is TIB? So tibialis. Both of my ankles in the tibialis were really, really jacked up at the end of the race. Now my left one more so, I still can't really walk on it. My right one is doing a lot better. But my left one is still very fat. I trained everything from my quads to my glutes to my cat, everything. But I really neglected this tibialis portion. And come to find out that's what got totally jacked up at the end of the race and into my recovery phase. So if I was to do this again, I would put way more training into that. I actually use an online mobility program a couple times a week and they actually have a tibialis session and I don't even know if I'm saying that right, but they actually have a session devoted to that. If you're interested in checking out that mobility program, the link will be in the description. Okay, next is to hold on until the morning. So the night run is very, very brutal. You have a hard time staying awake, obviously. You are kind of just stumbling around in the dark. It's super cold. Nobody really wants to be there. But just know that as soon as that sun crests the horizon, you almost have a 10x, it feels like, burst of energy. And that's exactly what happened to me and my pacer. It was absolutely great and we hammered out the last miles to that morning aid station just hold on until the morning it will be 100 percent better i promise okay foot care this is huge i actually didn't really do this too much on my 50 and it wasn't until my girlfriend mentioned that she was seeing other people do it in the aid stations that we should do it especially if you're running a mountain race your feet are going to be extremely extremely dirty so you need to get your shoes off you need to change socks you need to get someone with a towel and water to clean your feet so you don't have what ended up happening to me which was a giant blood blister i am an ultra fan and i use the tips now i can use the tips for any kind of training run basically as long as i want but when it comes to extremely long runs the tips just simply are too tight for me so probably what i would do next time is go to a wider foot box something like the lone peaks for later on in the race i actually switch shoes at about mile 36 but i should switch into another pair of temps and what was funny was the fact that i didn't have them laced correctly because they were totally new shoes usually i do the heel lock so it's a little bit tighter around my heel and at first i could feel how loose they are but as i kept going another 10 20 miles it was like I had the heel lock in there in the first place because my feet got so swollen. Also, something that goes along with this that I forgot to mention in the recovery phase, you might wanna consider having crutches on standby for when you get done with the race or for the subsequent days after. So the next thing is to have tools. You wanna have tools that you can use to dig yourself out of a low spot or of a hole. What would be considered tools? It would be music, caffeine, Tylenol, anything like that. I purposely didn't want to use any of those three until I really was starting to hurt and really actually need them because I knew that I had something to look forward to. I knew that I could have a little caffeine fix in a bit or I knew that I could listen to some music and zonk out. I knew all that stuff and it kept me going because I knew that I could get to a certain spot then finally use that tool. If you're just starting off the bat with all three of those things, you're not going to have anything to look forward to and you're not going to have anything really get any better it's just gonna actually keep getting worse the pain is gonna keep getting worse you're gonna get more tired right so instead of doing that I like having it for the middle or the three-fourths through the race now the name of the game with 100 mile runs is constant forward progress I'm sure you've heard this before but this could not be any more true I finished only 37 minutes before the cutoff and I did a pretty good job in my mind of getting through the aid stations as fast as possible, not getting vortexed into them, sitting down for 10, 15 minutes or trying to determine what I wanted. No, I got into the aid stations. I made my choices very quickly of what I wanted to eat or what I wanted my crew to grab. I would maybe sit for 
a couple minutes to get my feet cleaned and then I was out of there. Sometimes what I would even do before getting into an aid station was put in my notes on my phone what I needed when I got to the aid station because usually it was very chaotic so I would be able to rattle it off to my crew. I would also really make it a point to grab so many calories from the aid station and again I would just make sure that I had that many calories. I really wouldn't really look too much at the food and that I would be gone. During the night, my pacer and I got up to this aid station at the top of the mountain. There was a little propane fire. It was extremely cold. It was 37 degrees and there was two people in blankets passed out by this fire. And I have to imagine that they probably did not finish the race. And as I sat down next to the fire to just try and warm my hands up, I told my pacer that we could not spend a long time here and we had to keep going. I didn't care how cold it was. We would warm up as we started walking. So we grabbed some broth for our hands. We started walking and drinking the broth at the same time. And even though it was extremely cold, you know, if we would have took any more time at that aid station, I perhaps might have missed the cutoff. So you really gotta know that this time will add up. The last thing is knowing that everybody has adversity during a 100 mile race. For whatever reason, whenever something bad is happening, it feels as if you are the only person that is experiencing that terrible thing. And a lot of that thinking can really make you totally wanna give up, totally quit. Now I saw it all on this ultra. I saw a guy in front of me trip, dislocate his finger, have a contusion on his head. I saw my buddy that was behind me throwing up for the last 50 miles. I heard stories of people taking wrong turns and there was even a 73 year old that fell at the finish line. Now my own adversity came really from the tweaked ankle and giant blood blisters on my feet. So you have to know there's gonna be adversity in this race and you have to be ready to problem solve and grapple with it and move past it. And really that's when the race actually starts because if there is no adversity, there's really no growth from it. If it was totally easy, then the huge cliche of everybody would do it, it would be a lot more appealing to a wider range of people at least. So you have to expect that adversity, but you have to hold it together. That's really what makes an ultra an ultra. If you want monthly tips that I don't share on YouTube, sign up for my newsletter below. I send it out once a month with a bunch of tips, things that really good things I'm reading, really good videos to watch. Totally free. Sign up with the link below. And please leave a comment below. I'd love to know how stoked you are for your upcoming 100. If this video helped you for it, and if you finish your 100 and listen to this video, how it went. We'll see you for the next one.